people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Pratiksha Mishra with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show with the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence Summit which announced the adoption of the New Delhi Declaration. The declaration said that a global framework for use of AI should be rooted in democratic values and human rights. At the inaugural GPAI Summit on December 12 in New Delhi, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced the launch of a national artificial intelligence mission to strengthen the country's healthcare, agriculture and educational sectors. A report. Well, December 2023 marked the beginning of the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence in New Delhi. The Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence Summit, a congregation of 29 member nations including the European Union, announced the adoption of the New Delhi Declaration on December 13. The declaration agreed to collaboratively create AI applications in the fields of health and agriculture and to include the requirements of the Global South in the development of artificial intelligence. The New Delhi Declaration attempted to find a balance between innovation and the risks associated with AI systems. The declaration said that a global framework for use of AI should be rooted in democratic values and human rights. At the inaugural Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence GPAI Summit on December 12 in New Delhi, India's Prime Minister Narin Modi announced the launch of a National Artificial Intelligence Mission NAM, to strengthen the country's healthcare, agriculture and educational sectors. The Prime Minister also said that by setting up AI training institutes in Tier 2 and Tier 3 cities, the country is preparing people to benefit from the emerging technology that has the potential to change lives and bring about social change. Friends, AI ke saath hum ek naye yug mein pravesh kar rahe hain. Artificial intelligence ka vistar टेक्नोलॉजी के टूल से भी कहीं ज्यादा है एआई हमारे नए भविष्य को गढ़ने का सबसे बड़ा आधार बन रही है एआई की एक बहुत बड़ी ताकत है लोगों को कनेक्ट करने की उसकी क्षमता एआई के सही इस्तेमाल से सिर्फ देश की आर्थिक प्रगति ही सुनिश्चित नहीं होती बल्कि ये समानता और सामाजिक न्याय को भी पक्का करता है इंडिया इज अ फाउंडिंग मेंबर ऑफ जीपीएआई हैविंग जॉइंड द मल्टी स्टेक होल्डर इनिशिएटिव इन जून 2020 the initiative aims to bridge the gap between theory and practice on AI by supporting cutting-edge research and applied activities on AI-related priorities. Speaking at the inaugural session of summit, PM Modi called for nations to work together on a global framework to provide guardrails around AI. Prime Minister Narin Modi brought attention to the harmful side of artificial intelligence terming it as being capable of destroying the 21st century friends ai ke anek positive pehlu hai lekin isse judi negative baatein bhi utni hi chinta ka vishay hai ai 21vi sadi mein vikas ka sabse bada tool ban sakta hai aur 21vi sadi ko tabah karne mein bhi सबसे बड़ी भूमिका निभा भी सकता है डीप फेक का चैलेंज आज पूरी दुनिया के सामने है इसके अलावा साइबर सिक्योरिटी डेटा थेप्ट और आतंकियों के हाथ में एआई टूल्स के आने का भी बहुत बड़ा खतरा है
The first GPAI summit was held in Montreal, while the second and third were held in Paris and Tokyo, respectively. Recently, the EU passed the AI Act which imposes restrictions on the use of AI. The Act includes restrictions on law enforcement agencies' use of AI. Additionally, the Act permits complaints to be made regarding any guardrail violations. Manzoor Pashtin, a prominent Pashtun leader, was arrested by the police in Pakistan's Balochistan province on December 5. He was produced before the anti-terrorism court which handed him over to the police for seven days of physical remand. In response to the incident, the Pashtun Tahafuz movement recently organized a series of protests not only in Pakistan but in other parts of the world, including Germany, the United States, Austria and France. A report. Pashtuns held worldwide protests to demand release of Mansoor Pashtin, chief of Pashtun Tahafuz movement. Protests were organized in the US, Germany, Austria, France, and other parts of the world. The protester was seen shouting slogans like Pakistan is killing, the world is watching. Stop the Pashtun genocide and free free Mansoor Pashtin. On December 7, an anti-terrorism court in Islamabad handed over Pashtun Tahafuz movement chief Manzoor Pashtin to Islamabad police on seven-day physical remand in a case register in Tarnul police station. Earlier, Manzoor Pashtin was reportedly abducted by Pakistani intelligence services. The incident was reported a day after he was arrested by the police for addressing a protest to demand free cross-border movement with Afghanistan. The 29-year-old activist was arrested when he was travelling from Balochistan's border town of Chaman to Turbat. Chaman Deputy Commissioner Raja Athar Abbas had claimed that Pashtin was arrested for firing on police vehicles. However, the PTM had denied the charge. Supporters of Manzoor Pashtin are saying that the abduction and detention of their leader was yet another effort at pushing Pashtun youth to violence. PTA member Fazal ur Rahman Afridi lambasted the Pakistani military establishment for trying to stifle the freedom of expression and their right to peaceful assembly. Uh, you know, the Pakistani military establishment uh, is, you know, forcefully trying to stifle our freedom of expression and our right to peaceful assembly. Uh, but they cannot stop us, uh, you know, around the world. Uh, they can stifle our freedom of expression in Pakistan, but they cannot stifle our freedom around the world because we are living in free world. These generals, the uh, Chief of Army Staff, General Asim Munir, the DG ISI, General Nadeem Anjum, they are responsible for war crimes and crimes against humanity, including enforced disappearances, extrajudicial killings, torture and genocide of the Pashtun people. In Pakistan, those who demanded their fundamental rights are facing persecution at the hands of security agencies and Islamic fundamentalists. Baloch and Pashtun political activists have raised the growing issue of enforced disappearances in Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa in the United Nations Human Rights Council. Even though the successive governments in Pakistan have promised to make the practice illegal, people are still being forcibly vanished with impunity. Numerous activists, journalists and intellectuals have been reported missing, allegedly abducted by security forces or intelligence agencies. According to human rights organizations, such cases have been substantial. Reports have emerged of extrajudicial killings carried out by security forces in Pakistan. Thousands of cases of enforced disappearances remain unresolved in Pakistan. We want the international community to try them before the International Criminal Court. 
because they are violating uh, the international law, they are violating uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the United Nations Charter. So Pakistan is, doesn't deserve to be the member of the United Nations as we stand uh, before the United Nations Human Rights Council. Pakistan is on the verge of collapse, not just economically, but socially as well. And the voices of dissent are growing strong. Three of Pakistan's provinces, Sindh, Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa still remain underdeveloped, where poverty and malnutrition are rampant. However, the government does not appear to make any effort to upgrade the educational and medical infrastructure. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. After the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake, the evacuation orders in the Fukushima prefecture towns of Okuma and Nemi were partially lifted. The new buildings are being built and the residents are back. Jefudo or the Japan Food Product Overseas Promotion Center has appointed Rebecca Wilson Lai, a researcher, to study Japan's culture and tradition. I'm here at Manavia Yumino Mori School to learn about this wonderful project which just started in August this year. What job do you want to do? I want to be a comic writer. And this is your design? Yes. <gasps> wow! Student's design is printed on the bag and commercialized. She visits Nami Star Fallen Farm to meet organizer Mr. Daiju Takahashi. Starfish is fertilizer and protection against animals. I guess in some ways you're a little bit of an outsider coming into this community. How has the cooperation and reaction been from local residents? It's, it's been a um, great experience for me. Uh, people who have come back here, the local people, they are really, like, amazingly open, uh, open-minded and welcoming uh, for those outsides like me. Produce itself, uh, we are uh, growing root beet and also indigo dye plant and, and very rare plants like uh, juniper berry or agave tequilana, uh, which haven't been grown in Japan ever. Well, I've spent the day here in Namiyamachi and I've met local people, some local children, and even some outsiders who have decided to make Namiyamachi their home. And my takeaway from our conversations today have been there's a real sense of forward movement, as though there's a new era, a new dawn here in this small town. Now Fukushima is rebuilding an unparalleled community in Japan after overcoming tragedy. Foreign viewers of Japan can easily identify it. The Tokyo Metropolitan Government focuses on creating a city that is safe and secure, in particular to shield locals from the disastrous water and flood. Tokyo Metropolitan Government created a water reservoir pond and widened the river. Concrete pavement began to cover modern cities in the 1980s. It sparked regular water disasters in the city. Large-scale treatment was initiated as a result of unpleasant past experiences. Typhoon strikes Japan in the summer. It brings with it river flooding and residential inundation. After the construction of the underground big water reservoir pond, water flood damage decreased distinctively. Out of 28 underground water reservoir ponds, more than 20 reservoirs work to absorb flood water and prevent disaster. However, citizen cooperation helps to maintain a green environment and prevent flooding from water. 
758 tanks are positioned to store rainfall in the Katsushika district to prevent flooding. It is known as a miniature dam and can hold 26,000 tons of water. Preserved water is utilized to keep a green environment and daily life. Sanitary water comes from the preserved rainwater. It is developed by administrative leadership and citizen cooperation. Tokyo Metropolitan has a large following of both domestic and foreign travelers. Tokyo Metropolitan Police takes into account the safety and security of its citizens and visitors regularly. Indonesia's Merapi volcano erupted on December 13, spewing volcanic ash as high as 500 to 600 meters into the air, according to the country's volcanology agency. Footage filmed by the eyewitness showed a thick cloud of grey ash above the volcano in West Sumatra. Residents living in one of the villages closest to Merapi were still seen engaging in daily activities. The head of Indonesia's volcanology agency, Hendra Gunawan, said spewing of ash was relatively minor, with his comments coming after another eruption last week that killed 23 people. The 2,891-meter-high Merapi is one of Sumatra's most active volcanoes in Indonesia and straddles the Pacific's so-called Ring of Fire, which is home to more than 100 active volcanoes. At COP28, government ministers representing nearly 200 countries agreed to a deal that called for a transition away from fossil fuels. Seeking science-based solution to global climate crisis, Bangladesh demanded doubling of adaptation funding. At the conference, Bangladesh emphasized on political commitments from major carbon emitters to reduce global carbon emissions. The Bangladesh delegation said that the developed countries will have to play a leadership role to keep global warming within the range of 1.5 degrees Celsius. A report. At the COP28 Climate Summit, representatives from almost 200 nations agreed to begin reducing global consumption of fossil fuels to avert the worst of climate change, signaling the eventual end of the oil age. The deal struck in Dubai after two weeks of hard-fought negotiations was meant to send a powerful message to investors and policymakers that the world is united in its desire to break with fossil fuels. But climate experts and activists in Bangladesh are worried about how to fund the phasing out of fossil fuels in the developing nation. Bangladesh is trying its level best to phase out. Obviously, uh, it would require climate finance, technology support and investment. We have not seen that forthcoming at the rate that it deserves and at the rate which will enable Bangladesh to phase out on a faster track. Uh, it has the pathway, it is looking at the plans, but it, it, it is a country of 170 million people and they still need to go to school and have hospitals and they need to uh, develop. So it would be difficult to say outright that Bangladesh will be able to do this in the short term. It could do a lot more if the climate finance was there, if the technological support was there. Bangladesh also expressed disappointment over the draft text of the Global Goal on Adaptation GGA at the conference and demanded a doubling of the climate adaptation funding. At the conference, Bangladesh emphasized on political commitments from major carbon emitters to reduce global carbon emissions. The Bangladesh delegation said that the developed countries will have to play a leadership role to keep global warming within the range of 1.5 degrees Celsius. We hope that uh, this COP will deliver the promises the agreement made in the Paris uh, and 
limiting the global warming up to 1.5 degree at the same time support uh, developing nations and vulnerable nations through adaptation funding uh, and also the new uh, fund loss and damage that has been uh, f formulated in this COP28. Developing nations like Bangladesh are waiting to learn what the final deal would deliver to the world. Currently, nations are focused on two issues. One is to adopt ambitious targets to reduce global carbon emissions in climate mitigation and the second is to express the willingness of countries to overcome the climate crisis. I guess possible transitioning might have some impact, uh, so we, can, we will see that in the long run, but for now we have to see what it brings forward for us. Bangladesh's expectations from COP28 are rooted in the nation's urgent need to address climate change impacts and secure a sustainable future. By actively participating in negotiations and promoting climate solutions, Bangladesh played a pivotal role in shaping the outcomes of COP28. In COP28 uh, agreement, uh, Sultan al Jaber failed to meet the 1.5 uh, uh, degree Celsius target and uh, just transition required more finance, it should be funded. So we need a financial commitment to just transition from uh, fossil fuel to renewable energy and it's a big signal that the fossil fuel era uh, come to an end. Climate experts have repeatedly emphasized how urgent it is for the world leaders to take decisive action right now to reduce carbon emissions. They emphasize that more time that passes before taking action, the more expensive and difficult it will be to adjust to the continuous developments. For Bangladesh, a nation that is extremely vulnerable to the effects of climate change, COP28 is especially important. Moving on, Bala Chaturdashi, also known as the Festival of Lights, is a significant festival recently observed by Hindus in Nepal. It holds deep spiritual meaning as families come together to remember and honour their departed loved ones. The festival begins at sunset, transforming neighbourhoods into a spectacle of colours and lights. Streets are adorned with intricate oil lamps, creating a serene atmosphere that symbolises the guiding of spirits towards peace. Devotees offered prayers for the departed soul and seek blessings for their peaceful journey beyond this realm. Hindu devotees in Nepal camp out to stay up all night, lighting oil-fed lamps and praying for the salvation of departed soul to mark the auspicious occasion Bal or Bala Chaturdashi. Tarpaulins covers the ground of Pashupatinath temple, including the Bagmati river embankments. On the eve of Bala Chaturdashi, devotees who have lost loved ones in their family perform this ritual for the salvation of the souls of deceased ones. The festival of Bala Chaturdashi starts from Marg Krishna Triyodashi, the 13th day of the waning moon in the month of Mangsir. Devotees who observe this ritual maintain strict fasting with only one meal that day and abstaining from garlic, onions, fish, eggs and other food items that are said to be impure. In the evening, they reach the Pashupatinath temple or shrines dedicated to Lord Shiva and chant hymns and prayers to Lord Shiva all night long. They light Akhand Jyoti in the name of deceased souls of their families. The next morning, Marg Krishna Chaturdashi, they take a holy bath and start their journey around the Pashupatinath temple premises, spreading seven kinds of grains along the way. The seven grains include dhan, jaw, til, ghun, chana, makai and kagnu. Devotees walk along Kailash Surighat, Gauri Ghat, Arighat, Kueshwari, Mrikhisthali, Bishwarup, Kirteshwar, 108 Shivling. 
On the auspicious occasion, devotees float the live lamps on the river, which is believed would lighten the world of departed soul in their afterlife. Devotees remain awake throughout the night, campaigning on the edge of the Bagmati River facing the Pashupatinath Temple. ये हम यार तो बोती बालनी माधी बालनी रात भरी और त्यान बिया ना बोती चलाऊनी त्यान फिर यार को होम सान रोम लाऊनी तेरे कार्य कम जाम रो। As per Hindu mythology, one's ancestor will have a place in heaven if such seeds are sown in the shrines related to Lord Shiva and at the Pashupati area in the name of the deceased and family happiness is ensured. According to the myth, there was a trader named Balananda who had come to Aryaghat in Pashupati. There he was eating on the bank of Bagmati. Near him, a body was being burned in a pyre. Bala had a childhood friend named Brishra Sinha. The locals went to Brishra and they pleaded with him to kill Bala and rid them of the fear. Bala Chaturdashi is not just a ritual. It's a time for families to come together, share stories of their ancestors and strengthen the bonds that transcend generations. Bala Chaturdashi has its own charm and religious importance in people's hearts. And with that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. People have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect.